Okay, good morning, everyone. Today is our fifth session of our ecological simplification course, the short name, right? And today our uh, guest professor is uh, Felix Bianchi. He is a professor at the Barnigan uh, University in Netherlands. And today we are starting a second unit of our course that is named uh, Biodiversity Managed in Agroecosystem. And the um, topic that uh, Felix will introduce us is regarding agroecological approaches to strengthen biocontrol and pollination. Okay, um, just to, to, to mention that uh, Felix was part also of the Orteco project uh, where uh, Walter, Santiago, and Marianne, our, our previous uh, teachers, were also involved. So um, the work of Felix is quite well connected with the previous uh, topic that we already had. Okay, so Felix, thanks a lot for your collaboration to our course. Um, the place is yours. Okay, thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be, uh, a, yeah, to, to speak uh, to you. Um, let me let me share my screen. Let's see. Can you, can you see it like this? Yep. Yes. Sorry, Carlos. Sorry, Felix. Problem. It it but it's good if we say uh, say to the student if the ask Felix is he want to. The, if there's a student that has question, if they, he want to to uh, interrupt you in any time, or you prefer to at the end. And the other thing is, if any student have a question and and don't know how to say it in English, just ask in Spanish, and Carlos and me could translate it without any uh, to help you. So that's yep. all. <laughs> Yeah, and and it's it's okay to um, to ask questions, so that that's that that's fine. So if if you if you have a question about the slides, just um, yeah, just just ask, or maybe maybe you can, can put your hand up or anything like that online. Mm -hmm. Raise hand, yeah. for example. Yeah, yeah raise hand. <clears throat> um, okay. Um, so let's uh, so. Um, actually, uh, let me. Okay, this is uh, okay. My my screen is frozen. Let me see. It's okay. Yeah. So let me um, let me start um, with with the with the agenda of today. So today we will um, I will start off with a lecture on on pest control. Um, Usually, I expect it will take about maybe 45 minutes, depending on, on, on also the questions uh, that you guys have. Uh, then we can have a break. And then uh, Emiliano will um, give, give a uh, this discussion or give a presentation uh, on, on a paper. Um, then, then we can see how we are with the energy levels. And maybe we can have a short break or, or maybe continue. Um, then I'll continue with my, the second part of my lecture uh, on pollination. And then we really have to see how much time there is. So then there is the option of having a discussion uh, on, on some questions that I've prepared um, and, and a short uh, reflection. But let, let, let's see um, if there are many questions, uh, maybe all the time um, will be used for that. So that, that, that is also fine. Um, now, let me, let me start my lecture on, on, um, uh, on, on, on natural uh, biocontrol. Uh, by this by this picture, and I, I think this is a very nice statement. Um, so it, it says that natural enemies prevent the vast majority of the potential pest species from becoming pests. And I think this is a very inspiring um, statement because um, really uh, biocontrol is happening often without us even know, noticing it. And we are, are very well aware that that um, uh, crops and, 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 and natural vegetation uh, supports um, a wide variety of, uh, of herbivores. And those herbivores have natural enemies. But those natural enemies, they also have uh, enemies. And that's something that we can see in this uh, picture, um, that uh, there are even um, 
the NATO enemies that they're, um, they, they are also attacked. And it also shows that this is very complex. So there are many species and interactions happening um, in, in agro-ecosystems. Uh, agro um, so on one hand, it's, it's very nice that, that we have such an uh, efficient uh, natural processes of pest suppression. But then if you look in, um, in our crops, uh, often we see a different picture. So here you see some data on um, how much potential um, loss there is um, because of, 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 uh, of pest attack um, if you wouldn't use um, uh, uh, pesticides. And so that's, that's in, in the first um, uh, first column. And you can see, for instance, if, if you wouldn't use any, any insecticides, here's an estimated that we would lose 80%. So that it, that's the far majority of, 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 of the yield would be lost. And even uh, if we do use uh, insecticides, we're still losing uh, about 30%. Uh, here it says 29% uh, uh, for, for cotton. And maybe you can check out for the, the other crop. So um, this slide actually gives a completely different picture uh, than, than the, the, the previous slide, uh, where uh, we, we actually, uh, there was a statement that natural enemies are, are very effective in suppressing pests. Now, how, how is this possible? Does anybody, anybody of you have an idea why, why there is this, this seemingly uh, paradox? Why, um, yeah, pests are in, in, uh, actually uh, a, a quite, it can be quite a big problem, even though in, in more natural systems, uh, we, we hardly see an, any pest outbreaks. Does anybody have an idea why, why this could be the case? Um, can I talk? Yep. I think that is because uh, the large extension of monocultures. Yeah, yeah, that, that could that could be the case. And uh, let's let's have a look at, at the next next slide. We we can have a look at it. Um, yeah, because our, our many of our uh, in intensively uh, intensive uh, farming systems uh, actually they uh, they have a, have a low. Uh, biodiversity at, at, at multiple spatial scales. Huh? So, uh, and exactly like like you say, um, often when we look at, at this, this crop at, at the uh, bottom right uh, corner, right? actually you see basically there's only one plant species, and um, often this is, is well fertilized, right? so it has a high quality. And so, for the, it, it, it's a very suitable crop for uh, for the production and for for um, for uh, for herbivores. Uh, that, that can eat uh, the, the crop, uh, and, and this is then, then what we call pests. Um, but if you look for, for um, natural enemies, um, there are not so many uh, resources, um, and, and we'll talk a lot more about this uh, in this, um, in this, this lecture. Um, and then there are many uh, disturbances. So for instance, um, uh, there can, can be um, insecticide applications, there can be uh, um, uh, herbicide applications, um, and and also uh, um, the the harvesting can can, can be quite quite an, um, a big big uh, disturbance, and, and this makes these these environments quite difficult environments for natural enemies. And and on the other hand, they uh, many many of the herbivores or the pests they they can handle the, these disturbances quite well because often they they have a, um, a short development uh, cycle. And so they, they so you can have many generations so they can, can build up their numbers very quickly after uh, after such disturbances and then there's also uh, often quite common phenomenon that um, if the same insecticides are used over and over again that uh, herbivore populations can quite quickly uh, attain uh, resistance development against these uh, insecticides and so then it becomes even even more uh, more difficult to control them. Okay, so that brings me to the learning outcomes um, for today. So uh, the, the first one is to understand the factors that underlie pest management problems in crop production systems. Yeah, well, that's already what I alluded to already in, in my previous slides. Uh, then I would like to discuss the ecological requisites for natural enemies. And then finally, to understand uh, which mechanisms operate at the crop and habitat management level uh, to suppress pests uh, at different spatial scales. Um, 
Well, if you think about biocontrol, it's often very important that we realize um, what we're talking about. And one way to do this is just observing and, and looking what, um, who are actually the, the, the biocontrol uh, agents uh, of, of, of a certain uh, uh, insect pest. And well, you can do this uh, here in, in the field, like this, this picture is showing. Um, but we had, uh, um, there was a, a, um, a postdoc that worked in our team who actually had the idea that, uh, well, may maybe we can use um, a video um, monitoring. So what he, what he developed is a kind of system, what you see here, where we had uh, very monitored um, uh, uh, rice plants uh, that, that contained uh, brown plant hoppers. And he just made um, uh, video recordings uh, during the day, but also during the night. Uh, and then, then he, um, he, he watched those um, video recordings and then noted down uh, all the predation events um, of, of the pest. Now the pest that he looked at was a brown plant hopper. Right? This is an important uh, pest in, in rice. So uh, here on the left, you see some, um, some, some uh, juveniles and, and adults. Uh, and this is on the right, you can see how this looks on, on, uh, uh, on the plant. So they, they're, they're quite, quite tiny. Um, and then at first, we, we never did this. And so often when you're going to, to study this, um, well, you, you, you think very hard behind your desk and then you say, okay, well, let's, um, we were thinking, well, what, what kind of um, uh, prey should we use? And, and then we thought, okay, well, maybe we can, we can use uh, that uh, plant, um, uh, plant hoppers because it's much easier to, to bring them uh, to, to the field. And so that, that's what we did. Um, so we, we, we glued those uh, plant hoppers. Uh, I don't know, can, can you see my, um, my, my mouse? The, yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So we 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 glued them uh, on on rice uh, sheets. So this is this is the, the, the green is the rice sheets, and and here you can see um, some black, brown uh, plant hoppers. And we put them in the field, huh, like you see here on on the picture on the right. Um, and then um, so Tao Yi, Henry, he was a, the the postdoc. He he started the recording. And um, okay, let me see if you can see the video. So here are some, some snapshots of what he found. So he found, for instance, at night, he saw some um, uh, spiders, uh, jumping spider, feeding on, on, on the dead, dead plant hoppers. Jumping spiders. Rove beetles. Have you know that these are also uh, natural enemies? ground beetle huh? so that that even um, climbed the, the the plant but then the, the marsh fly and, and the marsh fly is not real a real predator it, it's it's more like like a like a scavenger um, and then we thought hey what what's going on here so we saw a snail well we for sure a snail is, isn't a, a predator so and then we got we got some uh, some doubts about the methodology uh, so then we even saw that these um, uh, these grasshoppers, eh, which, which are certainly not uh, predators, um, that, that, that our methodology was, was, was not correct. Um, so we, we observed, uh, uh, we, we found that, that we recorded uh, some scavenging uh, events, uh, but these are not real um, uh, natural enemies. So then we thought, okay, well, we have to come up with something else. Um, and then we thought, okay, well, we have to use uh, live prey. And um, here is some. Then you you can you can uh, watch for yourself what, what what we found then. And so here we see um, the um, the brown plant plant hoppers uh, walking on 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 the stems. Here you see a spider. We saw the ground beetle. Okay, well we we saw that before. And he has one, but we also found birds. So, and this was was uh, we we we've never read any papers that that uh, birds were actually um, predators of brown plant hoppers. Um, and then we saw that that there were also frogs, and actually frogs were quite active in um, 
and eating these, these brown plant hoppers. And um, also when you, when you look in the literature, you don't find, find a lot about it because most um, uh, um, people working on brown plant hoppers uh, are, uh, are entomologists. And um, so often, um, yeah, frogs and, 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 and the role of frogs and, and birds for, for uh, pest control is often uh, overlooked. So this was an important message for us that it's very important to watch very carefully what's happening in your fields. Um, okay, so this, this was a kind, kind of an uh, intermezzo. Uh, I would like now to, to move on a little bit more um, on conservation biological control uh, efforts at, at, at three spatial scales. So I would like to talk about the field scale, the farm scale, and uh, talk about uh, the landscape scale. And at landscape scale, actually, I will not talking about something that, that's good for biocontrol, but there's something that's bad for biocontrol. Now, if you look at, um, uh, at, the, at, the, at the field scale, uh, one thing that, that farmers can do is, is intercropping. And um, intercropping is, is, is quite widespread in, in, um, in many countries, um, and like in Asia, Africa, South America, possibly. I'm really quite interested to, if, if, you, if, if this is something that is still done or it's maybe more something uh, of the past or maybe something more by, by smallholder farmers who do it. Um, in Europe and North America, it is uh, not so common. In China, it, it used to be quite common, but these days it's also becoming uh, uh, less, less common. Well, why do farmers use it? Um, well, it is because they, they usually they attain higher yields and you have uh, less, uh, less well-developed um, weed disease and pest suppression. Uh, and and, uh, and maybe Emilio, Emiliano will, will tell us a little bit more about that uh, in, his, in his contribution. Uh, but there is increasing interest in um, having intercrops uh, because we, we noticed that if you have the, these large scale uh, fields, uh, that these are quite susceptible for, uh, for insect attack and also for, for diseases because they, they can, can spread free, very easy. Um, well, why are then intercrops then uh, considered uh, pest suppressive? Well, there are uh, several mechanisms. So the first one is that if you have a mix of, of a host plant and a non-host plant for a herbivore, um, it will be more difficult to find this host plant uh, for a herbivore um, because there are also these other plants around. Um, there is also a niche differentiation. Eh? So when you have different uh, plants with different uh, structure, um, there could be more shady areas, uh, maybe, or, or light areas, and, and this, this often um, will support a more diverse uh, natural enemy complex. And so there could be more natural enemies in the system. Um, some companion uh, plants uh, in, in, uh, of, 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 um, uh, of intercrops uh, can, can actually act as, as a trap crop. So they are, can, could be attractive and they actually pull away the, uh, the pests uh, that, that could otherwise uh, damage the, an important cash crop, for instance. Um, in some cases, uh, when you have multiple crops, uh, that, that they, when you have relay intercropping, uh, it could mean that maybe one of the plants, um, plant species is, is planted earlier and then later on, a second one, is, is the uh, companion plant is, is, is grown. But then overall, the, um, the length of, 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 the, um, of, of the growing season, hey, when, when there are plants in, in, the, uh, in the field, will be longer than in monocrops, hey, when, when you just have a single plant species. Uh, in this case, um, uh, this, this can offer opportunities for natural enemies to arrive early. And I'll also uh, tell a little bit more in, in, in one of the following slides about this. Um, some uh, companion plants uh, can also be uh, repel pests. Um, and well, the last point is maybe similar to, to the niche differentiation. Um, if you have a, an improved microclimate and more shady areas, or maybe more, a bit more humid, and when you have a more complex vegetation structure, and you typically get uh, more and more diverse uh, natural enemies around. And so this gives us some, some idea why these uh, intercrops are, uh, we usually have less pests um, than in, in monocrops. Um, so here you see a picture of, of a maize field um, and, and maize field 
uh, is, is uh, in, in, in Africa, but maybe also in, in, in Chile, uh, attacked by, by stem borers. And um, well, the, this can be quite uh, quite substantial, the, these, these pest attacks. Huh? You can, can uh, up to 80% of uh, yield losses, uh, which, which is really, really a big uh, problem. And this, this pest is hard to control because as you can see here on, on, on the picture um, on, on the right, uh, the larvae are entering uh, the, the stems uh, of the mice. And uh, even if you would spray um, insecticides, um, it, it would not harm them because they are protected on the inside of, of the mice stem. Uh, it also means that, that there are only few natural enemies uh, will be able to, uh, to attack them uh, because they either have to go through the tunnel uh, in, in the stem uh, or somehow get through the um, um, yeah, maybe parasitize through the um, uh, through the stem, uh, but but it, it, it's really a hidden hidden pest, and and therefore it, it can be a uh, quite difficult pest to control. Um, now, there is this this uh, push pull system developed to uh, to control uh, the stem borer, um, and you can see a picture um, here on the top uh, left. And so basically, it's it's a kind of uh, intercrop where you grow um, um, where you grow your your maize, uh, which is the, the most important crop, uh, and you have an intercrop with this modium. And this modium, it's uh, you can use it for fodder to, to feed your cows. Um, and uh, this this modium has the um, at least in, in in the theory is that it releases uh, chemicals which. Um, which which are um, uh, pushing away the uh, the, the stem borer uh, adults. Uh, so so the uh, the adults there are kind kind of uh, moth. Uh, you, you can see them in, in the top uh, top right, and they uh, they they don't like the, the smell of of this um, this this modium. So so they they are pushed away, um, and then around the the field there is napier grass. And napier grass um, is, is also a host plant for um, for the stem borer, and they 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 like to lay their uh, their uh, eggs in there. Okay? So and if you if you cut this, this napier grass, you can um, actually remove the uh, the stem borers from your field. Uh, and uh, and and typically the the, um, uh, the attack of, of your maize plants uh, is less because the, the stem borers prefer the napier grass. And so this is an, a nice system um, that's developed in, in, in Kenya. And um, yeah, it, it, it has been used uh, to, in, in a, um, to suppress the infestation of, of uh, stem borers without the use of, of chemicals. Um, well, this is how it looks like uh, in the field. Uh, you can see the maize plants with the desmodium uh, in between. And around the sides, you can see this quite clear uh, napier grass, uh, which, is, which are quite big plants. and um, Stem borers find that quite attractive. Uh, one additional benefit of this system is that uh, it can also use to suppress striga, and striga is, is a major uh, problem in uh, in sub-Saharan Africa. So actually, what you see in this, this picture, you see all these these um, purple uh, plants, uh, these purple flowers, um, and these purple flowers are from the striga plant. And uh, striga is actually, it's, it's a kind of a parasite. Uh, it's a plant that um, will grow with its, um, its roots into the roots of, of, of the maize. And it actually, it, it steals um, the, 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 the nutrients and, 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 and the sugars um, of, of the maize plant. And um, striga, um, it, it actually, the, the flowers look beautiful. But um, they produce a lot of seeds, and they are really tiny seeds. So, so once you have them in your maize field, they can cause um, problems for for the net for the coming years. And there are many there are many of these seeds uh, released. So it's it's really an important uh, uh, problem in in um, in Africa. And again, because you have uh, in this uh, push pull system, because you have this diversity of plants um, with. And desmodium is not a host plant for uh, for striga. Uh, you have much less problems uh, because many of, of the seeds that will, will germinate of the striga um, will uh, actually uh, find uh, the, the roots of desmodium instead of mice and will not be able to to, to germinate. 
And so this is also a kind of strategy to, to reduce this, uh, this Praiga problem. Um, and then the, um, yeah, there's a question. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, this module is, um, is a source of, um, es un alimento también el desmodium? ¿Se lo pueden comer o es solo para el ganado? Um, she's asking about whether that, that kind of plant is, uh, is also, is it useful for, for, um, for feeding animals or humans or what is the utility of that kind of plant? Besides yeah, so the, the farmers use it to, to feed cows, eh, to, to feed animals. Um, well, and actually we had a project also in, in Ethiopia where we also tested this. Uh, and there we also included uh, bean because uh, beans um, are for farmers that don't have, have cattle. Um, yeah, this morning is not so, uh, it's not so useful because uh, well, they've not, nothing to, to, to feed it to. But if you grow, um, replace the desmodium by bean, Actually, we found that it had a similar uh, positive effect on, on your suppression of your stem borers. Um, and beans can be eaten, um, can be harvested and, 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 um, and eaten by, um, by, 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 the, by the farmers' families. And so that, that, that also worked. Yeah, did I yes, answer yes. your question? Yes, yeah. thank you. Okay, Emiliano? Is, is this modium a legume? Um, that's a good question. Um, I, I think it, it fits as nitrogen, so it could very well be the case, but I'm, I'm not 100%, I, I would have to, to look it up. So maybe, maybe, if, uh, maybe in the break, uh, somebody can, uh, can Google this. I think it's a very good question, but I, th I think it fixes the nitrogen, so that, that will be an added uh, benefit. Yeah, someone typed it, type it in, in the chat. It is actually a, a legume. Yeah, yeah, okay, I already thought so, but I wasn't quite sure, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so, um, yeah, so then, then uh, well, this modium and, 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 and the maize here, you can see, you can, can uh, add it to, to, the, uh, to the house, uh, or uh, Ethiopia, maybe also beans also work, and, and those can be, uh, yeah, eaten by, by, uh, by, by, by families. <clears throat> Now I would like to move on to the second uh, second example, um, where we look at um, uh, the system that was quite common in, in China. So here you see at, at the bottom right, you see um, um, uh, wheat, and it's, it's already uh, quite ripe. And you see these tiny uh, crops uh, plants in, in the middle, and these are cotton. Now cotton, uh, is, is a is a uh, is a cash crop. It, it, it represents a high value, um, and and typically what happens um, uh, during the the growth of of the, uh, of the wheat, uh, which is planted before the cotton, that it uh, attracts uh, aphids, and these uh, cereal aphids um, they don't ha uh, are not so harmful for for uh, for the wheat plants, um, but they do attract. Um, uh, natural enemies like these lady beetles. So, so typically you, you find a, a quite a high um, aphid density and, and lady beetle density in the wheat field. Now, um, when, when the, um, during the, the, the growth of the wheat, then the cotton is, 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 uh, is planted in between. And then um, and, uh, the cotton can be attacked by the um, cotton uh, aphid. And cotton aphids can be a big problem for, um, for cotton. Now, you can imagine that uh, once the um, farmers harvest uh, the cereal, uh, the natural enemies are already present in the field and they can then just quickly go jump to the, to the next row where the cotton plants are and where they can feed on the, um, uh, on, on the cotton aphids. And here we see some, some data uh, about um, the densities of, um, of aphids um, in, um, in single cropping and in double cropping uh, fields. And you can see, let's see, um, so the alates, the, these are the, um, the winged aphids. So they, they can fly. So they, typically these are the um, uh, adults. And we see here that they, um, 
uh, are higher in, in monocrops than in the, uh, in the double cropping. Uh, and this was, uh, we've, this pattern was found in both in 1994 and 1995. Now, when we look at the uh, um, number of uh, aphids uh, without wings, uh, the, um, then we also basically we found the same pattern. And we found, found in, in monocultures of cotton, we found high densities of aphids, while uh, there were hardly any, any aphids in the, um, in, in the mixed cropping. Um, and then uh, at the bottom panel, um, we see the number of lady beetles. And there we see that there are many more lady beetles in the intercrops than in the, uh, the monocrops. So this, this really shows how effective this, this system is. Uh, and uh, by, by using this, this, this um, crop diversity uh, and having the, the predators that are moving from one plant to another, you get very effective uh, biocontrol. Uh, and this, this, this is caused because the temporal overlap, because the wheat is grown earlier, uh, it can already attract the natural enemies, and then the natural enemies are already uh, present in, in the field when the susceptible um, crop is grown, uh, cotton in this case, uh, where they can um, suppress the, the cotton aphids. Okay, then, then let's move to the, to the farm level. Let's Sorry, talk about... Felix. Sorry, yep. Felix. I'm not sure whether Amantina and Emiliana has a question or you maintain the hand raise. Raise. I, I have a question. Is that considered to be a relay intercropping? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And it is, it is relay intercropping because the wheat is planted first. Um, so first the, the wheat is planted, then it's growing, and then, then the cotton is, is grown, uh, and then then they're growing together for a while, then the wheat is, is harvested, and then the cotton grows further. So you have an extended growing season. Yeah, that, uh, that's a good, good question. Okay, um, then let's, let's have a look at, at, the, at the farm level, flowering field margins. So, and before we do so, what, what do you think that what resources do natural enemies need? So what, uh, be, um, what do they need to survive? Does any of you have any, any ideas? They need a source of uh, food. Yes, yeah. And, and what sort of food do you think they need? Like flowers and nectar and... Yeah. Pollen? I don't know how you say. Yeah, yeah, no, that, that, that's correct. Yeah, let's have a look. And um, here I, I would like to, to show you a, a, a small video. So here we see a, a buckwheat uh, flower uh, with a parasitoid, which is feeding uh, on, on the nectar. And um, flying, is, 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 it costs a lot of energy. It takes a lot, uh, and therefore you need, need some fuel. And uh, so if you have a sugar meal, huh, like nectar, um, this allows the parasitoids to uh, to have to be energized and and to um, fly to, to search for uh, for hosts. So let's have a look how this looks like. So here we have this um, the parasitoid, uh, and he found actually uh, a host, which is an, an aphid in this case. And what you see, what's happening here, uh, there's a parasitation. So the the parasitoid is laying an egg inside the aphid. Uh, you see it, that it's, um, and what happens next is that this uh, aphid, um, there will be the, the, uh, the egg of, of the parasites will develop inside the, uh, the aphid. And then um, from there, the, it will be eaten inside out by the, um, by the parasite. And then ultimately, there will be an emergence of a new parasite from, from the aphid. And so it's a bit of a horror uh, movie uh, scenario, uh, but this is very common in nature. And um, parasites can be very effective uh, biocontrol agents. Uh, but we, we saw that the adults, uh, they, they need the, the sugar um, and, um, in order to, 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 to be able to, to fly and, and to find the host. Uh, so uh, resources for natural enemies um, include uh, alternative prey. Yeah? So many predators, they, they eat um, other, uh, uh, other insects. 
Um, and if there are no insects in, in, in crop fields, well, they have to find it somewhere else. So um, often they will go to more natural areas, maybe forest edges or so, or so where they then looking for, uh, for other prey. Many natural enemies uh, like uh, flo uh, floral food resources, uh, nectar, pollen, uh, like, like you already mentioned. Um, and here are just uh, some examples. Uh, here we have, let's say, um, hoverflies. Uh, so hoverflies, the adults, are feeding on nectar and pollen. Actually, they are pollinators. Um, but some of the larvae, they, they, they are maggots, like, like you see here at the bottom left, and they feed on aphids. Um, and what you see here is a surfeit. Uh, it's not a, not a surfeit, it, it, it's a, a, a lacewing. And the larvae of the lacewings are, they, they look a bit like uh, small crocodiles, and they, they, they can eat also a lot of aphids. And so they, they, these are examples of, um, uh, of insect species where the adult stages are not feeding on um, other animals. Eh? They, they need nectar and pollen, but the juvenile stages, um, these are the predators. Yeah? And this is actually quite, quite common. Well, they also need uh, shelter. Eh? For instance, if, if a field is sprayed with, with insecticides, for instance, they have to move somewhere where they are, uh, uh, they're safe. Um, they need to hibernation places. Eh? Often in winter, there are not uh, many resources, so they um, have to, to have some, some place where they are disturbed and where they, they can spend the winter. And they need a favorable microclimate. Eh? When it really gets, gets hot in, in, in monoculture fields, uh, it's quite common that, that uh, insects move to more shaded areas where it's a little bit more cool. And in that sense, it's very much similar to what, what, what we do. Um, so, so here you see some uh, practice that, that's been conducted by, by some farmers in, in the Netherlands and also other places in the world. Um, I'd be curious to hear if, if farmers in Chile uh, do this as well. Uh, maybe we can discuss this, uh, this later. Um, and the idea is that by providing flowers for uh, beneficial insects, eh, but maybe also for, 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 uh, for pollinators, for instance, and, and for natural enemies, you get better biocontrol in your fields. Um, but we have to be to realize that um, not all natural enemies will be able to find the nectar uh, that's available in flowers. Okay? Because, for instance, if you look at, at the head of, of, a, of a parasitoid, um, they, they don't have a very long tongue. So they, they cannot um, get the nectar from, from all, all the, um, the flowers. Okay? Because we, if you look at the flower here on, on the left, uh, the, the nectar is typically indicated where my um, uh, the, the pointer is, so it's quite deep uh, in these tubes. And if if you don't have a long tongue, uh, you will not be able to to get it. So um, parasites will only be able to 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 get to access the nectar when the nectar is is really open, right? like we saw in, in the buckwheat flowers uh, in, in in the video. And um, here are some some. Um, uh, so some results from an experiment that has, has been conducted in the Netherlands, where you look, um, there is the number of hoverflies found in a, in a crop fields. Um, and um, on, on the right, on the x-axis, we see the, the coverage of flowers. And well, there, there, is, there seems to be a, a positive correlation. Eh? If you have more flowers um, around the fields, that you get more uh, hoverflies uh, in, in, in the field eh, that, that can, um, whose, whose um, uh, immature stages can, can suppress pests. But if you then uh, account for those um, uh, plant species of which we know that uh, it provides uh, accessible nectar for hoverflies, then we get a much stronger relationship. And so there you look at, at the bottom panel. Um, and these are only those plant species of which we know that they can, uh, that the nectar can be eaten by the, uh, the adult um, hoverflies. And then we see a, a quite strong relationship that if we have more flowers uh, in, in the flower strips, um, the higher the density of the, uh, of, of the hoverflies in the field are. And, and so this actually shows that, that this could be a, a kind of way to enhance uh, natural enemies uh, into, into fields. Huh? But we have to be aware 
that uh, there are some plants that, that may produce nectar, but this nectar is so deep in, uh, hidden uh, in, 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 in the flower tubes that it's not accessible for all the predators. And so we, we really have to have a more detailed understanding about, well, the shape of, of the mouse parts eh, or, or the tongue, and, and also the, the shape of, of the, the morphology of, of, the, of the flowers. Um, and then uh, let's move on to, uh, to the landscape scale. And, and here I would like to talk a little bit more about insecticide use, because insecticide use is, is very common um, in, in, in the Netherlands, and um, I bet it's also the case in, in, in Chile. Um, and, um, but it can also be uh, disruptive for natural enemies. And um, here is some, some work um, that we conducted in, in, in China. Um, and this was again the, the work of uh, Cao Yi. Uh, he also made, made uh, the same guy of, of, of the videos. And he, um, he looked at um, biocontrol in, uh, in rice crops. Uh, in, in China. And we looked at different landscapes because we thought that maybe some landscapes might be having more flowers, for instance, than, than other ones, uh, that, that, that they could support higher natural enemy uh, densities. And um, so in order to, to, to study the effect of insecticides, he asked farmers um, whether um, there could be small plots in their uh, rice fields where they, they didn't uh, do not apply insecticide, and the, and the rest of the, of the fields were then um, uh, managed as, as the farmer usually do, uh, thus um, including the use of insecticides. And um, what how you found is actually well, that's a bit what we what we expected. So we found that um, if you spray um, use insecticides, uh, that's indicated by the S, um, that you find less pest. Uh, a lower pest density uh, than, and than in the unsprayed. Um, and we also found that there are less predators, less uh, parasitoids. Um, so these, these, uh, the insecticides that the farmers used were not only bad for the, for the, um, for the herbivores and for the pests, but also for the natural enemies. And so these are broad spectrum insecticides. Um, well, we also found that there was um, less uh, uh, crop injury, and uh, less uh, dead hearts uh, or rolled leaves, uh, which are signs of, 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 uh, of insect attack. Um, and uh, the yield of sprayed fields was uh, slightly higher than the unsprayed fields, about 20%. And this is also what we know from uh, organic uh, agriculture. Uh, usually it's about, well, the yields are about 20% lower uh, on average um, for most crops. And so this was not, we didn't find so, uh, so surprising. Um, but when we looked at um, the, the capacity of natural enemies to, su to suppress pests, um, then we found that uh, natural enemies were actually quite uh, effective in reducing um, uh, pest populations. So what so he did is that uh, he conducted an, a, a cage experiment where he had uh, cages where, where he introduced um, brown plant hoppers and he removed all the, um, the natural enemies. And so these are the, the, the cages. And he had some kind of control. Uh, they were open cages eh, where the natural enemies and, and, um, can, could be uh, moving to. And, um, and then he looked at, uh, after two weeks, how many brand plant hoppers uh, there were in each cage. And he carefully um, controlled the number of, of brown plant hoppers in the uh, in the closed cages and the open cages to a certain uh, amount, so that you had you could compare the the contribution of the natural enemies that um, were not uh, present in the closed cages, uh, but that were available in the in the open cages. And as you can see here in the um, uh, in, in in the graph on the left. Uh, you see that in the closed cages, when there were no natural enemies, you find much more brown plant hoppers um, than in, in, the, in the open cages where the natural enemies were present. And so apparently these natural enemies were quite effective in suppressing um, these brown plant hoppers. Um, and this was the case in, 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 in two years. 
Uh, but but even though they were so effective, I mean they're they're not quite as effective as the insecticide sprays. Uh, but but still, um, well, the far majority of, of the brown plant hoppers were were eaten by the natural enemies, as you can see here. Uh, and um, so and and the other surprising finding was that that we uh, actually this was the level of biocontrol was quite quite. Uh, constant across many the many landscapes that he that he studied. Um, now the interesting bit comes in here um, when uh, so he started to make an economic analysis about um, how much farmers spent to insecticides and how much additional yields uh, the sprayed um, uh, rice represent. And um, what you see here is the um, uh, the the economic benefit um, of the uh, of 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 the insecticide applications, and um, well, when we when we account uh, in, in in a number of cases over here on on the top, uh, there were farmers that actually were the the, uh, the spraying uh, paid off in the sense that um, the, the the money that they spent on um, uh, insecticide was less. Uh, then the additional yield that they got uh, for spraying the insecticide. So in those cases, um, it was uh, profitable to, to use insecticide. But we also saw that in, in many cases, this was not the case. Um, and particularly um, when, when we uh, consider um, uh, the case when, when um, labor costs were not accounted for, about um, half of the cases um, it, it paid off, right? so it's actually prof profitable to, uh, to spray insecticide, but also in the other half of the cases uh, it, was, it was more expensive to buy the insecticides than the additional value of, of, of the higher yield. Um, and when you uh, would account for the labor cost, this would even become that it would only be profitable in 30% in of the cases. And in 70% of the cases, you would, would be better off to not to spray eh, because the insecticides are more expensive than the, the yield gain that you, that you get. And um, this really shows that um, we have to, that there is scope for different ways how to deal with this. So for instance, if those farmers would put the money that they would normally spend uh, on insecticide, if they would put that in, in, in a big pot and then, um, they, they would reimburse farmers who had severe uh, pest damage uh, and paying from that pot uh, that they would usually use for uh, buying the insecticides. Um, they, they would be better off financially and they all don't have to spray the, this broad spectrum insecticides and, and expose themselves um, to, to this, these harmful uh, products. Uh, and also it, it would be much better for the environment. And so it really shows that um, Farmers are, are using insecticides as a, as a kind of um, uh, insurance against uh, me, um, yeah, high yield losses. Uh, but in, in, in most cases, um, it is not, it is not uh, prof profitable. Um, so actually, um, and then we can ask the question, well, how, do, how does this uh, work if we, if we spray in, in different uh, fields? How does it work? Um, if, if, if you have mobile um, uh, uh, parasitoids, and the, here we actually we uh, I conducted a, a simulation study where we looked at uh, asked the question how much um, of the area of, of a landscape um, can be sprayed with insecticides in order uh, to still retain uh, biocontrol services, and um, well we we can we can uh, look have a look at um, so what I did is actually, it, it's a simulation model where we had a landscape that could be, consist of sprayed fields uh, indicated in, in the red or a non-sprayed uh, fields uh, in blue. And then I used many different uh, landscapes um, starting from landscapes completely um, um, without uh, of fully sprayed so that 100% that of, of the fields were sprayed up to that uh, none of the fields were sprayed. And I was interested to see, okay, well, how does that, how does that work? And if you conduct those studies, you find that there are typically kind of threshold values. So if um, about 
let's say 40% of the uh, of the fields are um, non-sprayed, uh, and and you're moving for going to to 50% uh, non-sprayed, then suddenly you can get an, an enormous increase in, um, in in biocontrol, and I can I can show you how that how that works. So in in, in the next slide. So suppose if we have a landscape um, of which 30% of the fields is or, uh, organic, there, there's no insecticide application. And um, then what happens um, is that you that you see here in green, you see the uh, the, the aphid populations uh, in, in, in the crops and they are, they are controlled by having often uh, insecticide applications. So, so that this causes this zigzag line. Um, and maybe you see at the, at the bottom there's a, there's a thin red line. Uh, these are the natural enemies. And basically, if we have um, um, seventy percent of the fields are sprayed, and because they, they are non uh, um, organic, um, the, the natural enemies, the the, uh, the parasites, are not able to, uh, to to establish their their numbers. However, if we increase the number of organic fields uh, to 80 percent, uh, so then now only 20 percent of the fields are sprayed, we get a completely different uh, picture. So we start with a very low um, parasoid density, but as soon as they, they um, uh, establish, we see that there is uh, there's no need for insecticide application anymore because the, the zigzag line uh, stops. This basically means that the, the biocontrol agents, uh, the parasoids, they can suppress the, um, uh, the the pests quite efficiently, and there is no need to use insecticide applications. Uh, but this only happens if there is sufficient non-sprayed areas in in um, in the landscape. And uh, so this basically shows that there is is a kind of um, yeah spatial effects where we and, and threshold values, uh, which is caused because these these parasites they are moving from one field to another. And if they are maybe developing in, in, in a non-sprayed field, but they go to the next field, the field next door, where there are insecticide applications, um, they will still be killed. And so you need a sufficient number of uh, fields that are non-sprayed in order to establish biocontrol. Um, and then I, I would like to discuss another, uh, another point, and that's the ecological literacy of farmers. Um, so, if you have farmers that are using uh, a lot of insecticides, uh, actually, it's 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 a quite convenient way to control them because you you don't need to know a lot of um, you don't need to have a lot of knowledge about these these insects because I mean if you, if you see them if you see your pests then you can spray them and um, here we conducted uh, and an, um, a, a study where we looked at how much farmers know about um, the, the natural enemies and, and, and the pests. And we found that, that about 70% of the farmers were unaware about the biological control potential of pests. And um, that farmers that, um, that didn't have this knowledge, they were also the farmers that, that you tended to use more insecticides. And this, this means that um, if you're Used to to use insecticides. Well, actually, you you are you can be de-skilling. So so you, maybe you you know less about uh, the pests and the natural enemies, and then this this can also result in in higher insecticide uh, use. And so I think it's very important that that farmers are aware about uh, biological control agents uh, and and when they have to spray and and when not, uh, uh, because yeah, this is what what this study uh, shows. Um, okay, well, this brings me to, uh, to my last slide of, of the first section. Um, pest problems need to be considered within their uh, production system and landscape context. And uh, we've seen that um, if you have, uh, let's say, large scale monocultures, uh, that they are often uh, very favorable habitats for, for insect pests and much less favorable for natural enemies because of the high level of disturbance. Uh, and that then it can matter whether there are maybe some some more natural areas around the field from which natural enemies can colonize the fields, uh, like for instance the, the flower strips. 
Um, plant production systems with temporal and spatial continuity can support effective natural enemy populations. And for instance, if you think back about the, uh, the system where we had this intercropping with the cotton and, and the wheat, and this is a nice example um, and that how plant and crop diversity can help to, uh, to enhance biocontrol. Natural enemies depend on resources that are often provided by non-crop habitats, uh, like for overwintering or for uh, providing nectar and, and pollen resources. Habitat management to improve um, natural pest control can be implemented at the field, farm and landscape scale. Uh, and, and often um, well, refraining from insecticides is actually a good thing for biocontrol. But on the other hand, of course, it, it can uh, cause also a higher crop injury and, and uh, yield uh, losses. Huh? And, and this, this is a struggle that, that farmers uh, have to deal with. And yeah, with that, I would like to um, open the floor for any questions that you would like to have. Uh, yes. Fabiola, raise hand. Uh, yes, yes. Fabiola. Um, in the case of uh, intercropping, what happened uh, the machinery? Uh, because the machinery actually is very specific, for example, for seeds or application. And um, what happened uh, when you have the intercropping? Uh, you to exchange machinery, modificate machinery. Uh, there is a, a cost uh, about this. I, yes, I, I don't quite understand. What do you mean by machinery? Um, for example, uh, machinery for seats. Um, and, and, but I, I don't I don't know the, the word machines uh, equipment equipment machines for for seeding things like that. For, ah, for, okay, okay. So to 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 do the to do the planting, you mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so I think well, um, having let's say this machinery going to to crops, uh, um, well, then they can be um, disturbances, but there are different disturbance levels. And so for instance, if you if you would plow plow under the the, 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 the the soil, there's probably a much more um, big uh, disturbance, eh? or when you apply insecticides, that's probably a bigger uh, disturbance if, than maybe just, just the planting, eh? or maybe the, the harrowing, or if you want to make mechanic um, weed control, for instance. And so, so I can imagine that, that um, di different practices have, have different impacts on pests and, and also on the natural enemy. Uh, yes, but uh, there is a cost extra. I don't. Uh, es, esto implica un costo extra en, en la producción. Carlos, por favor. Yeah, uh, uh, Fabiola means that if uh, this kind of uh, managing different kind of equipment and so on it represent an extra cost for 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 the for the system. I mean. Yeah, yeah. So um, I mean, if if you have um, yeah, so some some management practice, they they, they will have um, costs. Um, well, but if if you think about maybe some some agroecological uh, practices, um, uh, of course this might be the case. But also if if you uh, the example that we saw about the, the farmers that are buying the insecticides, that also takes a, a cost. Um, and mm -hmm. and well, we found that that let's say in about fifty percent of the cases. Um, well, the, the the cost of the insecticide was more than the 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 yield benefit, and so uh, also in in more intensive farming systems, uh, farmers are making quite some um, have to do some, quite some investments for to get uh, to make the investments needed to grow their um, their crops, uh, and they they really need to have really high high yields and high profitability in order to 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 to, to pay back their investments. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm not sure if it answers your question, but yes. this is a very important point that also I, I wanted to I want to to highlight in the analysis we have to consider not only the the deals I mean in terms of income for for the farm from from selling crops and so on but also regarding the the cost I mean 
uh, usually using pesticides and so on, you can reach very high maybe yields, uh, incomes, but also very high cost of, of using that kind of technology. So in the in the analysis at the end, we can we had to consider not only income but also cost. So that is the real uh, variables that we can uh, if we want to make a comparison between ecological management, let's say, with the compare with the conventional one. So a very 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 interesting point that you uh, present us. Thank you. I have a question too. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> because you say that um, with the thirty percent of the landscape uh, organics, is it not enough for uh, um, natural enemies grow in population enough to control the pest? Mm -hmm. And then you skip to eighty percent when is something happen? No, but how many is the minimum of landscape organics fields to make a um, difference in the population of the en uh, natural enemies? Yeah, so, and, and maybe it's good to, to point out that the, this, this is a kind of theoretical study. Yeah? This, it's a simulation study. Um, but in, in my findings, we saw um, um, that it's around, uh, around the 40 to 50% of the landscape, um, and then to, let's say if, if you're about 40 or 50 percent of the of the landscape, um, that is um, that that that's that's not sprayed, um, then the 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 the, the parasite population can can build up, um, and and the, the probability that they end up in in a field that will be sprayed is is is, is, is low enough to get get really high uh, levels of of, um, of of the parasites. And which can then provide top-down uh, pest suppression, and then there is also no need anymore to, for um, farmers, uh, for conventional farmers, to use insecticides. Uh, but it, this is we have to be a bit bit careful with it. Um, uh, but but we also did some some follow-up research on this, and and we do seem to find that um, the the proportion of the fields and the surrounding landscape that is sprayed. That that is a very good indicator for the the um, natural enemy um, densities that, that we are going to find in some places. And you can imagine that if if you have landscapes with a lot of insecticides, um, well, many of the, the natural enemies will be killed. And then, um, you know, the only way to 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 keep controlling the pests is, is spraying more insecticides. Right? Well, if we would spray less, it, it could be the case that there would be a time that there were. Um, well, the natural enemies population still have to build up, and then then we could have a period of, of high pest suppression. But the, the simulations then suggest that after some time, the, the natural enemy densities are so high that they can provide good pest suppression um, without the use of, of uh, insecticides. Yeah, but in this case, we we in our simulations we used a, a very efficient uh, biocontrol agent, and of course we we never know if if that's such a kind of efficient natural enemy would be present in our fields. That's something maybe you have to uh, figure out. Okay, muchas gracias. Luis? Well, Luis. Okay, thank you, Felix, for your talk. I wonder to know, I have two questions, I, and I wonder to know, because you show here some, some interesting patterns, but what do you think about your thought about you? You are part of the co-authors of the paper of CARP in 2018, where the most uh, conclusion is that uh, non-crops uh, habitat, you didn't find a, a global pattern about the, the importance of uh, biological controls in farms. Uh, and it's completely different that we have seen, for example, with pollinators that we have a we a strong relation about non-habitat crops uh, and the effect of wild pollinators for, for crop. What do you think? Because when you show some data, for example, floral margin, you, you, you see the, the, the impact in natural enemies uh, and in biological control, but the absence of a global pattern, what, what is your thought about that? 
Yeah, so I, I think uh, that this is a very good point. Um, and uh, well, the, the study of, of CARP, um, they, they looked at, at, at many studies around the world. Uh, so it, it was a, a meta-analysis and they, they, they looked at, okay, how much um, uh, non-crop habitat is there and um, what are, are, are the, the, the pest problems. And, and indeed, uh, like you say, there, there was not a consistent pattern. So, and this can be explained by, by several ways. So, of course, the, 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 the group of non-crop habitat um, is it, very, very general. Uh, it, it could mean, um, for instance, if you would have a forest um, with um, pine trees, or you have a, a forest uh, with, that, that are providing flowers, um, that, that was all considered the same. So it could be very well be the case that in some cases where we see actually a, a positive effect of um, non-crop habitat, that this provides resources that can be used for natural enemies, while in other cases where we don't find this effect, that this native, native vegetation does not provide these resources. And so that this is something, uh, and this would mean that we have to look a little bit more detail about yeah, what sort of natural uh, uh, non-crop non habitat uh, um, and um, well, another point that could explain this um, is, for instance, um, that these these interactions between herbivores and uh, natural enemies they, they can be highly dynamic. And maybe you can remember when maybe I showed the simulation. Now you see typically this these fluctuations in time. So um, depending on on the time uh, when you're taking your your measurement you might be able to, to find a positive effect or a negative effect. So depending on when you're coming. So in that sense, um, doing measurements about um, uh, pest control, it, it's more complex than let's say pollinators, because we typically have these, 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 um, these fluctuations over time. Um, and actually maybe, maybe there, there's been also a famous paper written by uh, Thea Chanka eh, that, that, that says, okay, well, um, five five reasons why uh, if, if non crop is, is not providing supporting uh, uh, biocontrol, and and he also explains some of the, these mechanisms. So I think in total he he um, he explains as five explanations uh, when when this is uh, is indeed the case. And so it, it it's not like like a, a rule that's always working for one hundred percent. Um, yeah, but so depending on on on, um, on on the situation and and these more details about the, the case studies, um, there are uh, yeah you can you can find variation. Okay, thank you very much. All right. Well, I think it has been <laughs> it took longer than we thought. I don't, that that's actually what we expected. Um, but Carlos, what, what do you want to do? Shall we have a break? Yes, I think so. Um, yeah, so what? Ten minutes. It's okay. Ten minutes. Yep. Okay. Then I'll see you guys at uh, in ten minutes. Okay. So Carlos, do, do would you like them to to continue with uh, the next presentation or? Uh, uh, um, I think that. Um... We can continue. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah. Good. If you guys are still uh, lots of energy, then, uh, then I can start with my second part of my presentation, which will be talking about um, pollination. Um, okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. So, so in the next hour or so, um, I would like to tell you something about uh, the, the principles on pollination ecology, and um, also to discuss okay why, why it's important uh, to conserve um, uh, pollinators eh, and and what are threats for for uh, for, for crop pollinators. Uh, we will also look into the, the ecological requirements as pollinators, just like we did for the natural enemies. And um, that this will allow us to better understand the underlying mechanisms uh, of crop pollination by bees at the landscape scale. Uh, because bees, like natural enemies, are also very mobile. Uh, so most likely they, they are influenced, but uh, can be but is done in, in other parts of the landscape because they are moving everywhere and they, they will also at some point end in, in 
um, maybe in places where uh, maybe disturbances are, are going on. Okay. Okay, so may maybe you know from a biology class from high school uh, that, that uh, pollination is basically a sexual reproduction by plants. And um, in, in, in many cases, uh, insects are playing an important role uh, by bringing uh, pollen from the uh, uh, from from the anthers uh, to the stamens, uh, and once once that this happens, um, and then you get um, you can there there will be uh, actually you can get sexual reproduction, and then you get seeds formed, which can then develop in in, in a new plant, uh, which can be potentially uh, a crop plant. Um, but there is a big differences in 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 mechanism. So so here you see, for instance, on the right, uh, you see see three plant species, we have peanut, soybean, and pumpkin. And both of them, of all three of them, they produce um, flowers, but they differ to a large extent to what they, they really require uh, uh, insect pollination. For instance, uh, peanuts, um, they, they don't need any, any pollination at all. They have natural uh, mechanism, alternative ways where they can, can um, produce the, um, um, that the, 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 the pollen from, from the own, own flower can, can uh, end up in, in the stamen and you don't need any, uh, an, any insect pollination. For soybean, uh, it's, it's slightly different. Uh, so there is a certain level of, of self-pollination, but if there is, is additional pollination by, for instance, uh, bees visiting uh, these, these flowers uh, and, and, and bringing uh, more pollen uh, to the stamen, uh, you get, get an uh, increase in, in yield and quality. Now the other extreme is uh, pumpkin, which solely relies on insect pollination. So if there wouldn't be um, a pollinators visiting uh, pumpkin flowers, your yields will be zero. So, so you, here you see that there is a, a, a plant, crop plants uh, depend on, on different uh, levels, uh, depend on, on uh, insect pollination. Um, there are also many um, other plants um, that uh, can use wind pollination. And here you see uh, many trees, for instance. Here you see some fruit trees. And, and actually what you, what you see here is that you have these clouds of pollen um, that are produced. And, uh, and in, in a way, it, it, it's a very inefficient process because you can, can imagine how much pollen uh, you have to make and, and, and uh, how small the probability is that some of these, uh, that, that the single pollen is landing on a, uh, on, on a female uh, flower of, of a tree. And so they're, therefore they, they're producing just these massive amounts. And you can imagine that if you have a more tailored system where you have an insect moving from one flower of, of, a, uh, of a plant species to another uh, flower, this is much more uh, efficient. And this is also explaining why this, this has evolved. Uh, nevertheless, if you think about important uh, food plants, crop plants, um, we see that, that grasses, uh, like, uh, like maize, uh, wheat, or rice, uh, these are all wind pollinated. So pollination, crop pollination, is, is, uh, is done by wind and not by, by insects for these uh, plants. Um, and, and then just uh, in the Netherlands, about 25 to 32% of the plant species are pollinated by wind uh, in the Netherlands. Um, I'm, I'm not sure how that, that will be in, um, in, uh, in Chile. But it also shows that, that well, the, the far majority of, uh, of plant species require um, insect pollination. And um, that this also shows this, this, this is not only important for, for crops. Eh? Of course, crops are important because they, they provide our food. But you can also think about natural plants, uh, wild plants. They also need pollination in order to, uh, to survive. Um, so pollination is, is really super important uh, yeah, to retain um, uh, plant biodiversity and also then ultimately also the, um, the other communi animal communities that they support. Um, but it's not only insects that, that pollinate uh, crops. Eh? I mean, uh, bees, for instance, here in the top right, I mean, they, they are a very important uh, group of, of pollinators. Uh, but there are also uh, bats or, or mammals or um, other insects or even birds that uh, provide in, in, um, in, in crop uh, pollination. 
and for instance, in in, um, uh, in in rainforests, about forty five percent of all all the plant species are pollinated by bees. Huh? But it's just clearly showing that that bees are a very important um, pollinator group. Huh? But they are not the only pollinator group. Um, so why are uh, bees or pollinators interested um, in visiting plants? Well, they do it because they, they want, they, they get a reward. Right? So they get uh, pollen, um, and this is providing important um, protein that is needed for reproduction, for instance. Um, and nectar is a carbohydrate, right? it's a sugar. Uh, they need it as, as a source of um, uh, as, as energy, right? because flying is, is very expensive in, in terms of, uh, of energy use. And uh, by having a meal of, of, of a sugar rich uh, nectar, um, then, then you have, um, you, you have, again, fuel to, uh, to fly around. Um, so pollination uh, is, is, uh, is, is quite important. And I just have a, have a question for you. Uh, if you think what you eat ate yesterday, what kind of, um, what, what kind of food items depend on uh, pollination? So who, who can mention something, some food item that they ate, ate yesterday or may, maybe this morning for breakfast? Uh, they are putting some word in the chat, Felix, if you want ah, to see. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, I, I don't see that. Maybe you can, you can help me, uh, Carlos. Okay, uh, they mentioned uh, avocado, yep. tomatoes, coffee, apple, yep. bananas. Yeah, and I'm, I'm very grateful uh, that these pollinators are around because <laughs> without coffee, I'm, I'm very grumpy in the morning. So, um, yeah. yeah. So, uh, well, actually, yeah. seventy percent of, of the crops depend on uh, on pollinators. Eh? And uh, here you see a list of food items eh, that that we often eat eat, eat at at a um, yeah daily basis almost. Um, when you look at, at the, uh, uh, the amount of, of the food, um, it is not that much, um, yeah, because most of the staple foods that we that we eat, yeah, like like uh, maybe maize or or potatoes or uh, these, these are often uh, not not pollinated. But um, if you think about vegetables and fruits, yeah, which are really important for a healthy diet, uh, these are often pollinated uh, crops. And moreover, um, by having pollination, you also get get an um, uh, increase in, in 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 the quality, and therefore they, they are also these products are also more valuable. Um, and here's just an example of, of uh, some of the, um, uh, the, the the items that that you might might have been eating, and and or how the shops would look like if there wouldn't be um, any pollinators. Uh, and you can see that it would be look very very empty. So um, yeah, so this really shows that, that for healthy diets, uh, crop pollination is, is, is really important. Uh, and here you can also see that um, if you have a, a limitation of pollen of pollination, that uh, well the crops, um, the fruits doesn't look they don't look very very nice, and um, yeah they're also less less nutritious. Uh, so it, it's um, yeah, there, there's it's a clear benefit of having good crop pollination. Um, well, in, in some cases, in some parts of the world, uh, people uh, where there is no uh, sufficient use of, of, of pollinators, so people do with some, some hand pollination, uh, for instance, well known in, um, in some fruit trees in, um, in China, they sometimes they, they do it. Uh, but of course, it's much better if there would be natural communities of pollinators who would do the, uh, the job of the farmer without having the farmer to do the uh, actual pollination. Um, often farmers uh, rely on, on honeybees. Um, well, honeybees, well, they, they are managed uh, by, by humans um, and they, they can be put um, in, 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 for instance, in, in apple orchards or pear orchards, uh, for instance, where pollination services uh, are needed. And of course, um, you can also harvest uh, the, the, the honey. Uh, that, that's also, of course, a, a, a food item. Um, so honeybees are quite commonly used in, in many parts of, of the world. Um, if you have a, a the summer colony size, about 40,000 individuals, eh, the, the many, most of them will be workers that, that will be fly around and um, yeah, 
visiting uh, uh, flowers and, and collecting uh, the nectar and the, and the pollen. Um, they usually uh, fly on, on a wide range of, of conditions. Uh, for instance, if it's warmer than, than uh, 12 degrees, uh, but if, it, if it's raining a lot, then, then they, they are less active. Uh, but they, they can store their, uh, um, their, their, their pollen and nectar, um, and then they, they can make, make the honey in order to survive periods in which uh, the weather conditions are, are not so, uh, so favorable. Well, the foraging range is a, up to six kilometers, but this is quite far. So usually they, they're moving around, um, yeah, between, between uh, maybe, yeah, between zero between or up, up to, to three kilometers. And um, then uh, that the, these are the most commonly visited uh, distances. Um, and it also depends on where the, uh, the nectar resources are. So they, they can, um, they visit many different plant species, but often if they, uh, if they find, for instance, a, a, a field of, of a flowering all seed rape or sunflowers, uh, they, they like to go up, up and down um, to, that, to that area. Um, and so they, they have, they visit many different flowers, but they, they once they, they are visiting uh, some kind of uh, a crop, a flowering crop, they prefer to go there uh, because they, they know where it is, where they have to be. Um, and, and, and in this such way, they, they can also uh, contribute to crop pollination. Well, they uh, have about maybe 10 flower visits uh, per minute, and they are really important in, for instance, apple and pear, um, and, but also in many other, other crops, uh, they, they are really important. And it, they're convenient because you, you, can, you can bring them uh, to, your, to your crop and, and maybe move them again, maybe to another crop. Amantina, you have a question? I have like a comment because uh, we use a lot of honeybees for pollination, but we have some uh, species is not no. uh, well for no. uh, honeybees, like uh, um, uh, palta, how do you say? Avocado is not a good, for, yeah, avocado is not good for honeybees. But you use honeybees to pollinate, and uh, it's complicated because sometimes we have uh, problems with uh, dying honeybees hives inside of the of the um, field. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so, and, and is it, um, why, why are the, um, the bees dying? Is it because of diseases or with, with insecticide applications or? Normally for application of pesticide or fungicide, here in Chile, we have a big problem with the uh, strawberries. A strawberry mm -hmm. is, a, is a, a flower, very good flower for honeybees, but we have used a lot of fungicides Mm -hmm. And that kill hives a lot. Yeah, yeah. Some of the fungicides they can also affect uh, the, the health of of, um, of 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 honeybees, and also in, in combination with insecticides. So actually, the, the the effects if you have a combination of fungicide and insecticide that that is much much worse for um, for for honeybees than only insecticides. So that 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 that's indeed. Uh, I think that that I I, I have read studies about that. And herbicides too is a problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and herbicides they, they they will remove the the uh, weeds, yeah, but some of those weeds are also flowering, so they could also provide resources for for pollinators. And so indeed that that, that can have a, also an impact, and 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 also maybe a, a, a direct effect on on the yeah on, on the health of the bees. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing uh, this this uh, this information. I mean that that's. Um, very interesting. Um, so, and actually, you, you already mentioned it. Huh? There the, the are threats for uh, honeybees. Um, well, so there, there's a lot of discussion about, for instance, neonicotinoids, whether they, they could have an uh, adverse effect. And it, there indeed seems to be uh, effects that they, they have a negative effect on, uh, on pollinators uh, in, in the European Union. Um, uh, some neonicotinoids are no longer allowed in, in field crops, uh, but but in, in, in greenhouses, uh, some some uh, some of these um, neonicotinoids are still used. Uh, but also uh, declining floral resources uh, in in our landscapes, 
Um, this could be related to, to uh, herbicide use uh, or having these, these more uh, intensified landscapes where there's less space for more natural habitats. And there have been also been uh, diseases like American fallbrot um, or Varroa mites, uh, which are actually um, uh, pathogens. Um, has, it, it, it's a parasite, this Varroa mite, is, it's a parasite, and you can see it on, on the back of, the, of, this, um, of this honeybee, uh, where it's actually um, yeah, sucking the, the hemolymph from, from, the, from the bee. So there are, th these, these are not so easy times for, uh, for pollinators. And there are also, also reports that uh, in many countries in the world, uh, pollinator um, densities are, are declining. Um, then, um, but besides honeybees eh, that are managed by, by humans and eh, by uh, beekeepers, um, there are also uh, many species of wild bees. So for instance, in the Netherlands, we have about 350 uh, species of wild bees. Um, quite a big number are on the red list. Eh? So they, they are very extremely rare. Um, so, um, but they, they can also be, uh, be important for, uh, for crop pollination. At least some of them that are a little bit more, um, uh, more common, of course. And if you have a very rare species, most likely uh, that is not so important for crop pollination because you have, need to have sufficient numbers. And if, if you have a red, red species of, of a bee, well, there are only very few of them. So they, they will, can never play an important role um, for, for crop pollination because, yeah, they, they, are, they are just, uh, there are not too few of them. Um, so the far majority of the bee species are solitary. And that means that they build their own nest alone by themselves. So not in, 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 in a group, but um, yeah, they're just for themselves. And this also makes them more vulnerable um, because they, they don't have food reserves uh, that, that honeybees have, for instance. Right? So the, the, the honey that they're making, uh, that will allow them to, uh, to survive uh, along long periods of, of food shortages yeah? because they have their own food. Um, but these solitary wasps, they, they don't uh, collaborate with other wasps and uh, uh, bees. So they, um, it's more difficult. And they're also more vulnerable uh, for these, these um, the changes in, in land use and, 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 uh, and, and insecticides, for instance. Um, having said that, um, some of them are really important in, in crop pollination. And here you see some uh, examples of, um, uh, let's say, uh, bumblebee species on tomato. Um, for coffee, you have also often uh, wild bees that are important, um, but also for, uh, for apple and, and almond. And so, and these are naturally occurring uh, bees that are flying around, uh, which, which are not managed by, by humans. And here you see uh, uh, results of a, a study uh, by um, Garibaldi, uh, which is actually, he's, he's a scientist from South America, from uh, Argentina. Uh, and he did a study where he looked at the contribution of wild insects and honeybees. And um, here you see a map of the world. And in pink, you see the contribution of, uh, of wild uh, insects in, for uh, crop pollination. And you see that there are many places in the world where you see a lot of these uh, pink, uh, large pink uh, blobs, uh, indicating that in these areas, uh, wild insects are really important. And um, well, here, here is a kind of a conclusion of, of the study. It's, uh, it's a bit birdy, but basically he, he's saying that um, wild insect pollination is extremely important. Uh, and, and that uh, if you would lose that, if you would lose those, those species that provide these pollination services, we would be in, in big trouble. Uh, so not only honeybees are important, also the wild bees are important. Um, but then of course, if you want to support uh, uh, high populations of, of these wild bees, um, we have to make sure that they can fulfill their, their life cycle and they have to, to survive the whole year long. And one of the things that they need uh, besides food um, is nesting and hibernation sites. And here you see some, uh, some examples of um, uh, what, they, what, they knew, uh, what they need. And many, uh, for instance, many of, of, of these wild bee species, they, they live uh, in, uh, under the ground. And so they need, uh, let's say, sandy areas 
uh, to um, have often with, 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 with sun that which are nice and warm and dry. Um, and others, they, they, they use um, uh, hollow stems, eh? like, like uh, the, in, in the top ones, say you have osmia bees, they, they like to, to lay their eggs um, inside uh, hollow reed or, or uh, bamboo sticks. And eh? people, people, you can easily make, make uh, bee hotels to, to support those. And we have to make sure that, that there's also sufficient nesting uh, and, uh, sites uh, present in the landscape. And then, yeah, there, there comes the question, well, uh, how much, how much of the, these areas should we have uh, for, for nesting sites and, and for food sites? That is, for instance, is, is one tree enough uh, in, in, uh, to have sufficient pollination or do we need, do we need more? Now, to, to study this, um, here I present some data from an uh, experiment uh, conducted in, in Costa Rica. Um, and this is work by uh, Taylor Ricketts, um, and, and he studied uh, pollination in coffee trees. And um, he measured, uh, he observed um, bee visitation of, of coffee plants at different distances from, uh, from a forest edge. Um, so for instance, he had uh, areas that were near a forest edge, um, at medium distance and are far from forest edge. And there he observed, okay, how many uh, flowers were visited by, by bees, how much, how well is the, uh, the pollination going, um, and so on. And um, so he found that uh, the number of bee visits was higher uh, when you were uh, in coffee plants near uh, native remnants, and then it decreased uh, at further distance. And, and when you're at medium and, and far distances, it, it was, uh, you had much less flower visits. So it suggests that these um, forest edges, they provided uh, some, some, some habitats for, this, um, for these pollinators, uh, these wild pollinators. And then when he looked at uh, the pollination def uh, deficit, uh, this is actually the, the kind of, um, well, how much, how much pollen are deposited on, on, the, on, the, on the stamen of, of um, uh, of, of coffee flowers, then he found that at, at when you are far from um, uh, the, the, the forest edge, and then then there was really a, a clear um, a limitation. There there were much less pollen on the stamens, and therefore also less uh, pollination than uh, when you are at, at uh, distances uh, far or medium from. Oh, sorry, uh, near or, or medium near uh, forest edge. And he found that, that um, when you're far from, uh, more, further than one kilometer from the forest edge, uh, there was about a 20% decrease of uh, coffee yield, uh, which is, is quite substantial. And um, so then they, uh, they studied, uh, also conducted a, a meta-analysis. Basically, they, they looked for literature studies, uh, studies published in literature. And there they, they found this relationship that uh, with increasing uh, distance from the forest edge, um, you see that there's a lower species richness and a, num a lower number of, of, of bee species that, uh, that you will find. And most likely that this has also consequences for crop pollination. Um, and so this, this really clearly shows that, uh, yeah, forest edges uh, can be important for, for nesting sites or providing flower resources for pollinators. Um, so, and these, these uh, solitary uh, bees, uh, most of the species will be solitary, so they have to, yeah, they, they are dependent on themselves, eh? so they, they have to, to find their, their, their nesting materials, they have to find their nest, they have to feed themselves, um, and they are also usually not so mobile, and so typically, well, we don't really have a, very good ideas about this, but, but often a, a distance about 50 meters or maybe 100 meters is uh, indicated as, as a kind of movement distance of uh, solitary bees. And you can imagine that in, in that area, if there are no flowering plants, uh, it will be very difficult to survive for solitary bees. And this makes them very vulnerable. Um, and, and here's just, just an, um, an overview as a study uh, published for, for the Netherlands. It's, it's already quite old, but it really clearly shows that um, many of the, of the Dutch um, 
species um, in the Netherlands that, that uh, they are indicated in red, meaning that, that we're losing uh, their species. Um, and well, there's m m many more new studies that actually show that this is actually happening in many parts of the world. And, and this is probably also caused by, by, by land use change and intensive management uh, practices. Um, and it, it, it's a reason for concern eh? because we, we know that these uh, wild pollinators can be important um, for crop pollination. Okay, so this brings me then to my last uh, slide. Um, plant pollinator interactions uh, are, are complex, eh? depending on, on, on flowering times. Um, maybe different species have different um, visiting different species. Um, uh, also, um, wild uh, pollinators said uh, they, they are active only during the limited time uh, during the year. Uh, and, and these are all things to, to be aware about. Um, some crop types depend strongly on pollination by human managed honeybees, uh, for instance, pear crops or apple crops. Uh, and it's very common to see um, honeybee hives in, in, in those uh, orchards. Uh, I'm, I'm, I would be curious to hear how that, that will be in, in, uh, in, in Chile. Um, wild bees have a high diversity and can also be uh, effective uh, pollinators of crops. Uh, and these are most likely the, the, the more common ones uh, because the, the extremely rare species, uh, well, they, they are just too few to be really meaningful for agriculture. Uh, but of course, they, they have an intrinsic value in their own. Uh, so I think it's still worthwhile to conserve these, uh, these, these rare uh, bee species. Um, Bee diversity and bee abundance declines at a worldwide scale. Uh, and th this is something that, that, that we are concerned about. Um, wild bees depend on nesting sites that are often provided by non-crop habitats, as for instance, the work uh, done by Taylor Ricketts, uh, showing that um, yeah, this effect of, of, of coffee um, pollination, uh, that, that you have 20% less yields when you are far from forest edges. Uh, so this only not only shows that um, these bees are have an effect for for the for the, for the ecology, but also for for the uh, profitability and and the productivity of coffee systems and also many other crops. Um, and pollination uh, serves uh, positively associated with forests. Eh? So forest conservation may not only good for the species living in the forest, but also for pollinators that can help humans with producing crops. And with that, I would like to uh, yeah open the floor for any any questions. Are there any questions? I, I um, don't have a question. But uh, I think it is it's important to think about how we use the pesticides because here in Chile we use a lot of uh, airplane applies, and thus is uh, um, dangerous for the natural systems that uh, are around of the the fields, and uh, the the rate of pollinization or the amount of pollinization is lower and lower and here we every year we need more and more honeybee hives to go inside the fields uh, and make pollinization and this is because we are, have lost a lot of uh, natural species who have done this work before. Mm. Mm, that doesn't look sound very very good then, but actually it, it is it is not. It's like this in in, in many parts of the world, um, and I think um, on the one hand it's, it's good that we still have honeybees eh, that that we can bring in and, and pollinate our, our crops. But on the other hand, if if we're only relying on on a single uh, bee species, um, and and there this suppose that there is uh, there are threats eh, like 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 diseases or. Uh, Proa mite or other things, eh, or, or insecticides, eh, like, you, like you say. Um, yes, we, we make ourselves very vulnerable um, for for yeah for the for the for this this uh, production of crops that rely on, on pollination. 
Yeah. I have a question, Felix. Um, in, in, in many places we have a agricultural system that are, let's say some, some way isolated. I mean, not uh, really connected with natural areas uh, that are useful as a habitat for insects, for example. My question regarding in, in that situations where we have isolated productive areas, uh, um how how efficient can be uh different kind of agricultural practices uh for example putting some kind of different kind of plants uh, to to put it as a as a artificial some way habitat for insect i mean what about the efficiencies of that kind of uh practices in this kind of situations yeah, that's a very good question. So, so I, I think your, your question is okay. Suppose if you would have, let's say, in a in a, in a very intensively used landscape, maybe maybe it would be an ecological desert. Uh, would it be uh, pay off actually to to invest in having maybe more flower resources? And um, I, I think it, it depends very much on on, on um, yeah how. Um, yeah, the, the, the situation, how, how, how bad or how good it is for, for, for pollinators. I think sometimes I'm, I'm confused, uh, I'm surprised that, that in, in case in landscapes that, that really look uh, very intensively, that are very man intensively managed, that you, that you still see wild pollinators. And so somehow they, they find a way to, uh, to survive and, and find the nesting sites and then flower source. So sometimes I'm really surprised how um, how well they, they are still capable uh, in, in um, surviving in, in these landscapes. Uh, as, as a general rule, I, I think um, providing more uh, flower resources or, or nesting sites can, can, can help. But um, maybe in very extreme cases, when, when it's really, really bad, and maybe also with maybe many insecticide applications, it, it, it would be possible that, 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 that you're in, in, in a, some kind of ecological desert area um, that there are hardly any, any pollinators left. And in that case, yeah, then, then maybe it's, it's not so efficient. Okay, thanks. What, Luis? Yeah, no, I, was, I will say that we think that we have an intensive landscape here in, in Chile, particularly. <laughs> but if you compare with Europe or North America, uh, at the landscape level, we have plenty of natural area or semi-natural area associated with our farms. So it's different. Uh, you in Europe have extended area with agriculture and just only with hedgerow. Uh, here we have our geomorphology permit a lot of natural remaining areas in, in some hills or, 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 or small um, ravines that could help to, 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 to improve the, 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 the provision of different ecosystem service like biological control and, and, and pollinators. And that's my, my, my reflection because um, I think that more than be organic, of course, pesticides are a threat to biodiversity, but more than to be organic or we need to improve the landscape, to change the landscape, to, to, to in, in, in increase heterogeneity, uh, increase the protection of natural areas. Uh, I think that it would be more efficient than just change, reduce, just uh, reduce the application of, um, of pesticides, of course, it's a problem, but but yeah, it, I think that the, the focus of the lens should be changed more than be organic or uh, conventional to to change the practice uh, at the landscape level. We need to to maintain remains of natural habitat or increase biodiversity in the landscape. Uh, and the other thing that I will I will say is that there's some. It's it's because the translation probably. Here, when we talk about the problem of bee, usually agricultures, extensionists, and, and many people think about honeybee. And when you talk about the, the bee crisis, usually we are talking about wild species, not honeybee, because honeybee is like a, it's like a, a, a cattle of uh, uh, we, we, we management, we, 
reproduce them. So it's, there's no problem with honeybee. Uh, the problem is with wild bees. And usually, as uh, you say, the, this amazing work of Garibaldi and, and your data, usually uh, crops are subsidized, are, are pollinated by more efficient by, 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 by wild species more than honeybee. Of course, honeybees give a level support, but, but we need to increase the, 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 the pollinators. It's, it's common sense if you think that one species, if you, you, you just focus our pollination of one species with one, the same behavior, with the same size, the same morphology, it's obvious that if you have a wide variety of visitors, you are going to be more efficient in, 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 to pollinate crops. So this is, I think, that the change that we need to, 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 to do or to in, in, in the lens that we need to change, particularly for agricultures, farmers, and extensionists, that we need to, to, to incre increase the, the, the provision of ecosystem service to our crops, yeah. changing the landscape. I think that's a reflection yeah. about the, what you are saying and, and your, the, the data that you show us, I think. Yeah, no, I, I fully agree with, with, with your reflection. And um, sometimes uh, you talk to farmers and, and you say, okay, well, if you have a good, crop pollination and um, it, it will give a higher yield than having maybe a fertilizer or pesticide use and so sometimes uh, farmers are, are surprised about what good pollination can can do for you and also um, yeah maybe maybe may for, for the money that, that you can make from your crop uh, and and if if you if you um if you tell this to, to farmers that then they, they become also much more interested in in, in the cultivation of, of, of these species for instance Okay, are there any more questions? Do you have more comments or questions? Remember that also in this group participation is very important. You know what I mean? Valentina, you want to ask a question? Yes, um, but it's not a question. It's a commentary that uh, I think that is uh, very important uh, to know our uh, native pollinators. And this is a, a, a work for, for future uh, investigations. Of, ex, I have, uh, there's a lot of uh, investigate uh, about uh, this tax, but uh, we don't know the the complete uh, biology of our or native native pollinators, and I consider that is very important for uh, for include them in the uh, in the agro ecosystem. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and, and, and I, I agree. I mean, there, there are many many knowledge gaps, things that that we would like to know, but we don't know. Um, that yeah we would like to to, to know more know more about them because then if we would have those insights maybe we could also find more effective strategies to conserve species and that are important for crop production yes yes okay carlos but what uh, what shall we do i think i think we have half an hour left mm -hmm. Um, maybe um, you had some questions. Maybe we can yeah. share some of your questions and maybe to open the discussion regarding the, the questions maybe or, or working in groups yeah. as, as you want. Yeah, hmm? yeah. I, can, I can share that there in my, in my slide so I can sh share my screen again. Okay, so I prepared some questions. Let me see if this works. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so th these are some questions for the biocontrol. Huh? That was the first part of the lecture. Um, 
maybe, maybe you want to, and I've also in the next slide, I've also some, some questions for, um, for pollination. So may, maybe you want to take a minute maybe to, to, to read them or maybe to, to write them down or take a photo or um, that, uh, and this is something that you can uh, maybe discuss in, 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 in small groups um, about, well, what, 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 do, what do you know about this, uh, what, what is known about uh, uh, this, this question about uh, biocontrol and, and what, are, what is the kind of information what, what you still would like to, uh, to know? Okay, so I'm going to move to the next slide for pollination, basically the same kind of questions. So, um, uh, Carlos, are, are most students working from home? Can, can we make groups or is it? Um... Yeah, we can, we can do uh, groups. For example, uh, let's say four groups, something like that, if you think it's okay. So we, I, can, I can split the, the, the group in, in four ones. And mm -hmm. then they have to discuss, uh, give them some, time to discuss this question and to present then to the all the, the full group some uh, answers regarding this uh, four question right yeah and uh, I think an uh, outcome of a discussion can, can also be that 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 you that we don't know something I think that's that's also interesting and so you don't um, it's not only about the things that we know but sometimes it's also important things that that we don't know that yeah. that we yeah. that, that we know that that we are not knowing something ya, yeah. eh, voy a repetirlo un poco en español, que, que además de responder esta, entregar algunas respuestas a estas cuatro preguntas, también dejar así como algunos comentarios acerca de cosas que, que a lo mejor no sabemos acerca de estas preguntas que él presenta acá, ya, también para dejarlo como, como un, importante saber qué cosas no se saben o, o que el grupo no, no, no entiende o no sabe, ya, así que voy a separarlos en cuatro grupos en forma aleatoria y... Uh, Felix, I mean, I, I, I think 15 minutes is, is okay. Then we have five minutes uh, remaining to discuss and to present the result, right? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Okay. Entonces ahora los voy a dividir en cuatro grupos. Tienen que pinchar ahí para ingresar a su grupo. Van a tener 15 minutos para tirar ideas y respuestas acerca de estas preguntas. Y, y en 15 minutos vol volvemos al mismo espacio y compartimos lo que, lo que pusimos ahí. ¿Ya? Dame un segundo. Ya. Yeah. Ahí les llegó un, un aviso seguramente para que ingresen al grupo que les, les, les corresponde. Uh, to the practice become an imbalance for pollinator or does it become a negative? Sorry, I, sorry, I didn't, didn't quite, can, can you repeat the question? Puedes repetir la pregunta, Loisha? Um, uh, I put in the chat. <laughs> Pero mejor que te traduzca el, el profe, Aloich. Bueno. Yeah, uh, 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 the question from Aloisha Felix is about uh, to what extent uh, do practice become an imbalance from pollinator or does it become a negative one? Yeah, so uh, yeah, I think, I think there's a very general question there because it, uh, a, a practice, there are many, many practices. Um, and and some some practices are could be even like the, the crop choice. Eh? So, um, as I think it it, it will uh, yeah it depends very much on 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 um, what 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 the practice is. 
to, to see what, what, what the implication is, is for, um, for, for pollinators and then for which pollinator groups. Uh, so I, I think the, the, the current question is, is very, very general. Um, so it, it will be difficult to say something specific about this. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay, let's go with the last group. Um, I know who are the the the, the, the people inside that, that group. Um, I know Pascal. Tú estás en ese. ¿Quién está en el en el último grupo que no ha presentado? Que represente a su que quiera comentar compartir lo que discutieron. Um, Yo puedo decirlo. Gracias, Tamara. Um, ok, I'm going to try. <laughs> um, eh, we, we have two uh, distinct uh, regions. Uh, here in Chile, eh, um, we say that the uh, one of the most important species uh, are uh, avocado and citrus and tomato. Uh, but Celso uh, in Mozambique uh, has uh, maize, cassava, and uh, um, many kind of beans. Um, the conclusions uh, that we have uh, are were uh, very similar to the other groups, but uh, in resume we, we can resume that in uh, we have not uh, not uh, as as a group we have not a lot of knowledge about the um, best species and even less about the uh, natural enemies of that species. Uh, so uh, we think that the um, way the institutions forms the professionals that have to, um, I, I don't know the word, um, uh, help the agricultures uh, didn't, uh, did not consider uh, the part of the biological control. Um, uh, in the pollinator um, part, um, we have a little more, more knowledge. Um, we identified um, important species as tomato, coffee in Mozambique, and avocado, cherries, and tomato, but in uh, growing in the greenhouse um, as an important pollinator dependent species. Um, the, the important groups were uh, bees, wild bees, and surface, and uh, parasitoid wasps. And uh, in conclusion, in both of the parts, uh, pests and pollinators, uh, we think that um, requirements and management uh, relates to uh, in, in, introduce more uh, natural areas or semi-natural areas at the three levels, like uh, the crop, uh, the field, and the landscape. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Tamara. <laughs> Muy bien. Um, anyone has a comment or question regarding Tamara presentation? If there's no more comments. Um, maybe Felix, if you want to close the session with some message, final message. Yeah. No, it, it was really, really a pleasure to uh, to able to um, yeah to to tell a little bit about my, my work um, on, on pollination and and uh, biocontrol uh, with you and and to, to also to hear about um, 
yeah, the things that that uh, the, the crops that you grow in, in Chile, uh, which are very different from the Netherlands. So I'm I'm always eager to to hear about this and and learn about this. And uh, well, I I hope that you also um, yeah learned a little bit more about my my, my story. So um, it was really a pleasure, and I uh, also would like to thank Carlos for the uh, opportunity to for, for to give this this presentation. Thanks a lot to you, Felix. For, I think for, for us it was a pleasure to to listen to your uh, contribution, to share uh, to, uh, that you share your experience in these topics. I mean, it was very interesting, very very dynamic. I like very much your slides, your videos. Um, and well, um, um, hopefully, as we discuss during the break. We have the chance to to continue these kind of topics. I mean, they're very important to 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 to, to trans to, to to start this kind of transition, right? Uh, to to more sustainable agriculture. I mean, so uh, new researchers as that uh, like this uh, group uh, are, uh, have a very important role to the future research and 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 contribute with this new knowledge in order to support this kind of transition to more sustainable uh, farming, right? Okay, um, thank you very much, Felix. We are still, we keep in contact, right? We will share with all of you the, the, the material, the, the recording, also Felix probably will send the, the PDF uh, the slides to share with you. Um, well, you have also already have the, the, the lecture, the paper that Felix uh, shared with us. Um, well, if uh, 